kill me, but they can't hurt me. Poets were not in joy to charm me. Were that joy a Pagpalang umaga po sa inyo lahat. Morning Church. May I request the congregation to stand.
Let us read Psalm 24, verses 1 to 5. Psalm 24, verses 1 to 5. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. May the Lord add blessings to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Our most precious God, we thank you and we praise you for this wonderful morning. Thank you for the life, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your mercy and grace that are in you every morning. Lord, indeed, you are worthy to be praised. You are our hope, our refuge, our strength, O oh Lord. And uh, you are omniscient, omnipotent, and you are the creator of all the creation. Lord, uh, as we have our service today, guide us and lead us. Uh, ihanda niyo po ang aming mga puso, Panginoon, sa pakihinig na inyong salita. Bless the preacher. Bless the congregation. And Lord, we commit to you the whole service today. May you be glorified in everything that we are going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design. In the lives of those who prove His faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight, by faith our fathers roamed the earth with the power of His promise in their hearts of a holy city built by God's own hand, a place where peace and justice reign. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our souls we will till the race is finished and the work is done we'll walk by faith and not by sight by faith the prophet saw a day when the long for Messiah would appear with a part to bring the chains of sin and death Triumph from the grave. By faith, the church was called to go. In the power of the Spirit to the lost, to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth. We will stand. Children of the promise, we will feast our eyes on Him, our souls as we will, till the race is finished and the work is done. We will walk by faith and not by sight. By faith, this mountain shall be moved. And the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are passable. For all who call upon His name, we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes. 
Christ on him our souls we won Till the race is finished and the work is done We walk by faith and not by sight We will stand as children of the promise We will fix our eyes on him our souls we won Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms What a blessedness, what a peace is mine Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all
the Lord who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since scares us lost his grip on me for i am his and he is mine but with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From Lazarus cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand Good morning, everyone. Uh, please join us in uh, congressional responsive reading of the Westminster Confession of Faith, Chapter 16, Good Works. Uh, may I request all the men to read along with me and for the ladies to read along with uh, Christine. Let's begin. Good works are only such as God has commanded in his holy word, and not such as without the warrant of scripture are devised by men out of blind seal or any pretense of good intention. These good works done in obedience to God's commandments are the fruits and evidences of a true and living faith. By them, believers show their thankfulness, strengthen their assurance, build up their fellow believers, adorn the profession of the gospel, shut the mouths of the adversaries, and glorify God. They are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, so that bearing fruit unto holiness, they may attain the outcome which is eternal life. Their ability to do good works is not at all from themselves, but entirely from the script of Christ. And in order to, to do these things, besides the graces believers have already received there must also be an actual influence of the same holy spirit working in them both to will and to do god's good pleasure this truth however 
should not cause believers to become negligent as though they were not bound to perform any duty without a special moving of the Spirit. Rather, they ought to be diligent in stirring up the grace of God that is in them. Those who attain the greatest heights of obedience possible in this life are so far from being able to go beyond duty and to do more than God requires that they fall short of much that is their duty to do. We cannot, by our best works, merit forgiveness for sin or eternal life at the hand of God. This is true because of the great disproportion between our best works and the glory to come and because of the infinite distance between us and God. We cannot benefit God by our best works nor render satisfaction for the death of our former sins. For when we have done all we can, we have done merely our duty and our unprofitable servants. This is because, in so far as they are good, these deeds proceed from the Spirit, and in so far as they have done, they are defiled and mixed with so much weakness and imperfection that they cannot endure the severity of God's judgment. Nevertheless, because believers are accepted through Christ, their good works are also accepted in Him. They are accepted not because believers are in this life unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight, but because He, looking upon them in His Son, is pleased to accept and reward what which is sincere, even though it is accompanied by many weakness and imperfections. Although the works done by unregenerated men may in themselves be things which God commands and things which are useful to themselves and others, yet because they do not come from a heart purified by faith, are not done in right manner according to the word and are not done for the right purpose, which is to glorify God. They are therefore sinful and cannot please God or make one suitable to receive His grace. Yet, neglecting them is even more sinful and displeasing to God. Please be seated. I feel like I don't have to preach. Um, that was a very, uh, very deep uh, chapters. Thank you, uh, Torres family, for reading that. Before we pray, I just uh, I remember the lyrics. It said, uh, "We are children um, of the promise, and uh, we are." And I hope you realize that we are children of the promise, um, not by anything we have done, right? Not by anything we have done, not by anything um, we can earn. We are children of the promise, meaning the promise, the gift of eternal life, that was gifted to us, and we were chosen by the Lord to be those children. That's it. It was all uh, because of the Lord. What an amazing, uh, what an amazing truth. And the truth of what we just read in the Westminster Confession of Faith, that truly um, man cannot do any good apart from Christ. If we were really, really serious about uh, being able to do any good in this world, it starts by bowing down to scripture in the church, right? Because you cannot go outside and, and expect to be a force of good if you are not good inside, right? It starts, uh, it starts by surrendering to the word. All right, let's, uh, let's join as one body and let's pray. Father God, we praise you for who you are. 
we thank you for you are all-powerful. We thank you for you are sovereign. We thank you that everything that is happening is by your divine decree. And because it is by your divine decree, it will all redound for your glory. And we thank you that you allow us the privilege to be used as your instruments for the furtherance of your kingdom here on earth. Father, we praise you for your unfathomable wisdom. We thank you that in the moments that we do not understand your word, the Holy Spirit assures us and gives us peace in our hearts. We thank you for the, the despite our weaknesses and, and failures, you are there to uh, allow us and keep us from stumbling. Thank you, Father God, as as Brother Jeff prayed this morning, that your mercies are new every morning. You give us a fresh start every morning. The very breath that we are breathing now is allowed by you. And so thank you, Father God. Thank you that you allow us to, 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 to work and move your purposes. And who are we, Father, to, to, to be used for your glory, and yet you give us that privilege. Thank you. Father, we praise you for our families. We thank you for the families that you have given us, that you have gifted us. Father, help our families to be families that uh, abide uh, under uh, your uh, biblical design of what a family uh, should be. And Father, we thank you that you are molding us towards that daily. We pray for the fathers. Would you allow the fathers to first and foremost uh, that the submission to Scripture begin with them, that a household surrendered under your uh, Scripture with the, with the father and the husband leading that. Would you allow him to protect the family from anything that is uh, not in accordance with your word? Would you allow him to, to stand firm on, on you, the solid rock? that no matter what the world throws at him, he would remain firmly planted in your word, in your firm foundation. We pray for the mothers, pray for the wives. Would you give them the joy, give them the joy that, and help them to understand and, and truly give thanks for the privilege of having the role the the role of raising children according to your word help them to be excited help them to be zealous to raise their children according to your word allow her to be the source of love and and peace and, and patience and kindness and gentleness in that home. And would you allow the, 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 the couple, the married couple, to honor you and continue in their covenant uh, as they glorify you in their relationship. We pray for our children, Father. We thank you for the gift of children. We know, Father, that uh, these are uh, gifts from you and we are but stewards of them. And help us to raise them uh, with the fear of the Lord. Help us to boldly uh, raise them and care for them and love them and cherish them in a manner that would be pleasing to you. Father, give, give parents wisdom on how to, um, how to continue and, and, and raise their children uh, during these times. Give them the wisdom. 
And I pray for our children. Would you protect them, Father? Please protect them. Continue protecting them from the evils of this world, the confusions of this world, the, the seeming ideologies that sound so enticing and that seem so correct and yet is completely uh, misaligned with your word. Allow them, Lord, to remember you. Allow them to draw near to you. Allow them to put you first in their lives. Father, we pray for our nation. Uh, we ask, all we ask, Father, is that according to your will, you would allow all our national and local leaders to be confronted with the truth of your love and your justice, of which they cannot escape. Would you allow them to see what truly matters in this life, which is to know you and to submit to you? According to your will, Father, would you grant them salvation? We pray for the Christians and believers in, in, the, in, the, in the government places. Help them to stand firm. Help them to be uncompromising. Help them to boldly stand firm for your truths. Protect us from uh, any, any laws that would hinder us from obeying your word. Protect us from any uh, local principles and uh, local ordinances that would prevent us from fully obeying and abiding in your word. Protect your church, Father, and protect your children. Help us, Father, to truly be a salt and light in this world. And, and what that means for us, Father, is that you would help us to truly manifest the grace and mercy that you have so lavished upon us so freely. Help us, Father. Help us. Finally, Father, would you allow us the wisdom to hear your word this morning? Help us to focus on you. Help us not to be distracted by anything and help us to uh, reflect on these and, and uh, be able to take action, uh, be able to uh, move according to how you convict us. May you alone be glorified as we continue this series on uh, Acts chapter 15. In Christ's name we pray, amen, amen. Good morning, everyone. So we're going to be tackling this morning Acts uh, chapter 15, verses 13 to 21. Medyo relax nang siya ngayon. It's not that... Uh, it's a fairly, um, it's, it's a lot of good reminders. Okay. The past Sundays, we've been discussing um, if salvation is by law or by grace. And, and clearly the Bible says it is by grace, right? Ephesians 2, uh, 8 to 9, right? For by grace, you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, right? Not your own <laughs> For by grace, and that's, the, that's the cause of it, you've been saved. What was the instrument through faith? Uh, did you have anything to do with it? No, not your own doing. Uh, so how did you get it? It's the gift of God, not a result of works. Why? So that no one may boast. So that if we do boast, we only boast in the mercy of Christ. Right? Galatians 6.14, may I, Paul says, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So 
our realization of our sinfulness, our realization of our inability to cleanse ourselves from sin, our acknowledgement that we indeed need a Savior, and our belief that that Savior can only be Christ Jesus alone is a gift from God. Our ability, our understanding, our faith to believe in Christ Jesus as the only name under heaven by which anyone can be saved, this belief is a gift from God. We didn't develop this faith. We didn't train ourselves or will ourselves to believe this. God gifted us. God gifted us this faith and this faith to believe in Christ Jesus. And that faith leads to a grace, a grace that cleanses us, that purifies us, that restores us, that reconciles us to the triune God achieved by the once and for all perfect and complete sacrifice of Christ Jesus as he died on the cross for our sins and as he rose from the grave soon after. Amen? You know, we can end right there. All right. However, we are learning that there are people during this time in Acts who are trying to distort the doctrine of sola gratia, okay? And, and even to this very day that's happening, right? The, the wickedness of man makes him think that he can earn salvation or, or that he already is righteous. And with that thinking, grace loses its primacy, grace loses its efficacy, it loses its power. And that's really the issue here. Yan talaga yung issue dito. By adding any additional requirement to salvation other than by the grace of God, we are already nullifying the grace of God. Now, last Sunday, Peter rebuked the Judaizers who were insistent in adding circumcision and the laws of Moses in the Old Testament as necessary requirements prior to salvation to these Gentile Christians from Antioch. And the way Peter argued uh, was by recalling what he had personally witnessed and experienced during the conversion of the centurion Cornelius in chapter 10 of Acts and his family and relatives. And how despite them being Gentiles, by faith in Christ, not only were they justified, they also received the Holy Spirit immediately as a sign that all who put their faith in Christ Jesus, regardless of race or ethnicity, would have the seal, the guarantee of the Holy Spirit, that all whom the Father gives to the Son, regardless of race, none will be lost. None will be lost. And so this morning, we're going to hear from another church leader who will also provide a strong argument uh, that indeed salvation is by grace alone, this time through a prophetic scripture. To mean Gentiles are also saved by grace alone because this is a fulfillment of what scripture has already declared. Okay? Nakatakot yung mga intro, no? Ang haba. Hindi nyo alam kung saan tayo abutin. Don't worry, we're going to finish quite early today. Acts 15, let's read together. Acts chapter 15, verse 13 to 21. Begin. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols 
and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. God bless the reading of his word. Let's begin verse 13a. After they finished speaking. So we read in verse 12 that, uh, Bar just in the previous verse, that Barnabas and Paul related to the people what? Signs and wonders, right? They related to the people signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. This was the second speech, okay? This was the second speech. We, so we now have a defense from Peter uh, of a factual situation wherein Gentiles were saved by grace through faith with Cornelius and his family. This was the first speech, now, as we begin the third speech, which comes from James, his defense will be on the basis of prophetic scripture. From a, from a bird's eye view, a truth implied here is that while actual experience is a strong defense, which is what Peter did, and while signs and wonders are definitely a strong influence and motivation as shared by Paul and Barnabas, in this third argument, James would tell them that ultimately all these things will be and must be verified in and through Scripture. Even if signs and wonders are present, the question should still always be, and write this down, whether Scripture agrees with it. I may, may, I may wake up one night and see my, uh, uh, my, uh, my, my uh, closet burning, like a burning bush, right? What does Scripture have to say about this? The ultimate test of truth, and this is what we all want, right? We all want to know the truth. Everyone is saying fake news. Right? We, we all want to know the truth. The ultimate test, when I say ultimate, this is the, the way you determine truth for everything. The ultimate test of truth, brothers and sisters, is not your feelings. But do you base? Because feelings are very subjective, right? It's erratic and it's tossed by the waves of life. I might be feeling happy one minute and then um, Marlon might say a, a bad joke to me and I don't feel good anymore, uh, very quickly, right? I, I might, you know, end up telling Marlon, hey, how was your, uh, your haircut this morning? And he would be very upset right away, right? Because maybe that's not the right question to ask him, right? It's not whether uh, something results to success either. That's also not how you base if something is true. If it succeeded in the world or if it failed in the world. Why? Because evil systems and evil individuals are allowed by the Lord to succeed while at the same time people with good desires fail in this world for his purposes to come to pass. The ultimate test of truth for anything and everything in the world is simply this. Does Scripture agree with it or not? And take note of how I worded this. The premise is that Scripture is what is true. It's not do you agree with Scripture, right? I'm not saying do you agree. With, I don't care if you agree with Scripture, right? Because Scripture bows down to no man. It's does Scripture agree with you? Understood? So brothers and sisters, in fact, we have absolutely no authority to, to question Scripture, right? So brothers and sisters, even if someone shares with you a true experience, even if you witness signs and wonders, because Satan can cause some of those things, right? Even if you witness signs and wonders, be like the Bereans, in Acts 17, right? The Bereans were described as Jews that were more what? More noble than the, the, than the, Thessalonians, yeah, the, the 
Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, <laughs> because they received the word with all eagerness. And they, uh, they, they examined scripture daily to see if things were true and accurate. So all the ideologies, opinions, thoughts, and claims of this world and from non-believers, it's not whether you feel like it's correct. What matters is does Scripture agree with it? Just on the side here, huh? uh, let, me, let me just move on the side. As a footnote to all our dear parents, I want to encourage you all. Um, when I say encourage, I really mean do it. No? I want to encourage you all to assess and examine the worldview of your children and assess together with them if the things they agree with, if the things they feel for, if the things they believe in, does Scripture agree with them? Do that, please. Because the ultimate and final authority to what makes our decisions and guides our actions is scripture. That is what makes you different from the world, brothers and sisters. Okay? Okay, uh, verse 13b. <clears throat> James replied, brothers, listen to me. Um, before we proceed further, I, I think it would be helpful for us to have a proper understanding and, and knowledge of who James is exactly. So, so we can appreciate even more what he is about to say, considering who he is, okay? Just a very quick uh, rundown of who James is, okay? Uh, James is the half-brother of Christ Jesus, right? He's the half-brother of Jesus, earthly. And one of the first times we encounter James is during the early times of Christ's ministry. So if you look at John 7, uh, verses 2 to 5, now the Jews feast of booths was at hand so his brother said to him so kundito si james they're talking to jesus and sabi nila kay jesus leave here and go to judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing for no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly if you do these things show yourself to the world for not even his brothers believed in him <clears throat> So James, despite being closely related to Christ, was very skeptical of who Christ was and of the things that he was doing. Tamang duda lang si ano si si James. He basically told Jesus, "If what you're really doing is real, then don't just do them in secret. Go to Judea, do it there in front of massive crowds. Then." I will believe the works that you are doing. Now, something happens along the way. James's skepticism towards Christ would significantly be reversed when he became one of the first witnesses of Christ's resurrection. I guess that's going to change you when you see the risen Christ in person, no? Um, and in obviously the, his conversion. In 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 7, it says here, then he appeared to... James, <laughs> then to all the apostles. A true encounter with the risen Christ would turn this skeptic into a stalwart yet humble servant of Christ. In fact, in the book of James, which he wrote, he just identifies himself as a servant of the Lord. And just a note on this, and take note of this, no one, no one, no one who encounters Christ truly will remain the way they are. No one who encounters Christ truly will remain the way they are. When our holy, merciful, gracious, and loving God enters into your life, it is simply impossible 
to not be transformed and compelled to pursue holiness in our lives because there is no greater change that can take place in a man's life than from being dead in our trespasses to becoming alive in Christ. From being a slave to sin to becoming a slave for righteousness. From being condemned to being redeemed. There is no greater transformation than these. Sabi nga ng ibang pastor, there is no such thing as a Christian secret agent. No? Secret Christian ka lang. Okay, what does that even mean? That is impossible. Impossible. And so a word of caution. If you are here this morning and you are not compelled in any way towards pleasing the Lord and abiding in His words and desiring to pursue holiness in your life, I pray you would find time this morning to pray to the Lord and seek His mercy so that you will be able to submit to His will and His commands for you through Scripture so that you can begin today living a life for Christ, not a life that simply pursues the lusts of your flesh. Okay, moving on in Acts. We also see, what else about James? In Acts 1.14, um, James is part of the group of people praying at the upper room. Okay, verse 14. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. James is here. And then from this point onwards, <clears throat> God would use James to be a key leader in the church of Jerusalem. That's a transformation, right? From being a skeptic and a doubter to being a leader and a key uh, figure in the church of Jerusalem. Just like Paul, a murderer on his way to murder Christians would return um, murdering his own life for Christ. The Apostle Paul, um, when he was newly converted, nakita sila ni James in Galatians 1.19, but I saw none of the other apostles except who? <clears throat> James, the Lord's brother. Then several years after this, we see Peter reporting to James how he escaped from prison by God's miracle in uh, Acts 12, verse 17. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, <clears throat> he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison, and he said, Peter, no? tell these things to James <clears throat> and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. And then here in the Jerusalem Council, excuse me. <clears throat> Nagbike po kasi ako na mahaba, so affected yung throat ko. Hindi wala namang kinalaman, no? <clears throat> here in the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, it's quite clear that James is a chairman or something like that. No, he clearly has influence. Uh, and finally, James is, uh, did you guys know James is called James the Just? James the Just. Siguro ganun dapat ang mga names natin. No? Ch Chari, the accommodating. Para, di ba? <laughs> di ba? Uh, Chris, the, the servant or something like that. No? Para we, we know, no? Okay, mag-isip kayo kung ano yung mga gusto niyong uh, tawag sa inyo. And why is he called James the Just? <clears throat> it's, again, from being a true skeptic of Christ, he would actually live uh, with a very, he, he would live his life in a very strict observance of the law. Okay, he, he was like a Paul. And, and what's interesting here is that Despite James being a strict observer of the law personally, it would be him who would display the greatest grace 
towards the Gentile Christians and dare not expect or demand from them a life for Christ which resembled that of his own or of the Judean Jews. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Verse 14, Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. In fact, look at how James refers to Peter. He doesn't even refer to Peter as Peter, right? He, he refers to Peter with his Jewish name, Simeon, sometimes Simon. A good reminder for the crowd that James himself knew all the laws and practiced them strictly, yet he did not demand his observance and conduct of worship to the Lord as a yoke around other people. James held the highest standards for his own spiritual worship and obedience to the Lord, yet he was very tender and gracious with other people's spiritual worship, as we will see in a bit by the decision he would make regarding the issue at hand. <clears throat> One thing to take here, brothers and sisters, you have every right to hold yourselves to the highest of biblical Christian standards, as you should. But when dealing with other people's spiritual journeys, like James, we must exercise gentleness, patience, grace, mercy, and love. Amen? Our goal is not to make other believers to be like us. Our goal is to edify other believers and build them up towards Christ, not towards us. You know, Pastor Raul is very rigorous in his study. You know, as a very young uh, kid, a lot of my memories uh, of him is me seeing him uh, with his face buried in front of a book. He's reading. If it's not the Bible, it's a spiritual book. If it's not a spiritual book, it's the Bible. And, and, he, I'm sure, and he has a, he's very demanding with himself and his time. You know, he, 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 he demands excellence from himself. And yet, uh, when you talk to Pastor Raul, you don't feel that, do you? You feel a kind of tenderness as if uh, it's very gentle. Sa akin lang hindi gentle si Pastor Raul. He's very firm with me. <laughs> and praise God for that, no? You know. And, and that's how it should be. That's how it should be. Verse 15 to 18. 15, and with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tents of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from of old. Don't worry, don't be scared. I know that was like a little confusing. Simple lang yan, okay? Let's understand this better, but we need to go to the Old Testament. We need to go to Amos 9, uh, 11 to 12 to understand this a little bit better. In Amos 9, 11 to 12, it reads, In that day I will raise up the booth of David, the house of David, that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord who does this. So several things we get uh, from here. Number one, <clears throat> first is that this text is about the house of David being restored in the future. We're not talking about a physical house. huh? We're, 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 it's, we're talking about lineage from the line of David, a son of David. In fact, when you see a son of David, what that really means is the Messiah to come. A son of David, one who will restore elect individuals so that they can once again be reconciled with the Lord completely and for eternity. And you, you can read this in Luke 3, right? It trace yung genealogy. The son of this, the son of this, the son of this, right? That's the purpose of that, by the way. That's very important because it traces and proves that Christ Jesus is indeed the foretold Messiah. 
Okay, you can read Luke 3 and uh, even Matthew 1. We clearly see that the Christ Jesus is the promised Messiah, which was mentioned in 2 Samuel. That's number one. Second, it's very clear in both those passages, the one in Acts and the one in Amos, who is the ultimate source and initiator of everything. Look at Acts 15, 16. What does it say? I will return. I will rebuild. I will build its ruins. And I will restore it. Who is doing it? Amen. So even in the prophetic scripture, it is already very clear that salvation is initiated and en enacted by the Lord, right? He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it in you. He who began it, he. Third, in Amos 9.12, it talks about Edom and all the nations. What this means and what it's implying here is that uh, all nations, because not everyone belonged to Israel or, and there were others who were non-Jews, obviously. So which means the restoration that's being discussed here, the rebuilding, the Messiah will bring about salvation not just for the Jews, but for all nations. Dun palang, as early as that, sinasabi na yon. Okay, number four, the requirement for salvation is only that you be called what? By my name and no other than the Lord. It is the Lord who calls. So the Lord will call his children by name from all nations. And so Acts 15, the Gentiles being incorporated into the kingdom of God is a fulfillment of this promise in the book of Amos, the prophet. Okay? So not too hard, right? Yun lang yun. So we need to understand, brothers and sisters, and believe the biblical truth that everything that is happening in the present is simply God revealing what he has already sovereignly decreed in eternity past. And this should comfort us in that everything that is happening is under the unfathomable control of God. The second comfort we can take is that everything will redound for God's glory. If I say this a lot, it's because we forget it a lot. And so we need to remember this. So, if everything that happens, God has allowed from eternity past, and everything will ultimately redound for his glory, do we still have any cause to be anxious about tomorrow if our hope is truly in Christ Jesus? Verse 19. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. So given all the arguments presented so far, and again, let me quickly recap, beginning with Peter. His argument was that, number one, faith does not depend on man but on God. Number two, faith purifies, as mentioned in Acts 15, 9, and that faith is alive in the heart, not just a memory in the past, right? Faith, and, and today, faith is alive in you, right? It's not just a distant memory of you saying, I, I put my faith in Christ Jesus. That date is not what saved you. It's a daily surrender to the Lord, right? Of course, you were already saved at that moment, but you uh, going up on the altar or saying something, that's not what proves your faith. That faith is alive in the heart, it's not just a memory in the past like what the Judaizers were doing. They were attaching their righteousness to their past laws. They were attaching their righteousness to their adherence to these past laws instead of living out Christ's likeness and his truth daily. And finally, given James's argument that what is happening in this council over this controversy is in fact already settled 
as this matter of the Gentiles being saved by grace alone is already a fulfillment of Scripture. Given all of this, James' influential decision is that nothing further should be added to the conversion of the Gentiles. And by way of saying this, we Jews should stop bothering the Gentiles, especially those pursuing Christ. James makes his decision very clear. Paul's argument that salvation is by grace alone is correct, and what the Judaizers were teaching was incorrect. There's no middle ground with Christianity, brothers and sisters. You can't, have, uh, you can't be tiptoeing uh, with Christianity in the world. You are either saved or you're not. You are either a child of God or you're not. There's no neutrality. Your father is either Christ or your father is, yeah, <clears throat> the devil. You cannot, there is no middle ground. Which is very deadly because today a lot of preachers teach that there is such a thing as a middle ground. That there is somehow a way to be in Christ and still enjoy the lusts of the world. Verse 20. But should write them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. So after affirming that the Judaizers were indeed incorrect, James reminds the Gentiles that while they are also saved by grace through faith, it is part of their Christian maturity to abstain. Abstain from their old habits and practices. Right? Ang ganda nung binasa natin, nagtugma yung Westminster Confession of Faith. Yung good works. Sabi doon, it's not that we should, it shouldn't lead us to neglect as if we had no duty. Practices that not only are inconsistent with, the, with their new life in Christ, <clears throat> but would potentially offend the Jews. The four specific things that James tells the Gentiles to abstain from are idolatry, any form of worship that begins to take up residence in our hearts and minds. You know, anything that sways you away from Scripture, that's idolatry already. Anything. Okay, so assess yourselves. What are you trusting over Scripture? What are, what are you shouting for over Scripture? Any form of worship that begins to take up residence in our hearts and minds, displacing Scripture and Christ, that's idolatry. Sexual immorality, which blasphemes the Holy Spirit which lives inside the believer and something specific for them at that time. What else? Animals that were killed not by the shedding of blood but uh, via strangulation. Uh, specific na lang to for time. And animals who were not cleaned properly from the animal's blood. Um, yung mga kumakain po ng dinuguan dito, you may, you may, be, you, you may be calm. It's okay. No one's telling you to, to stop eating that. Okay? <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, while we have Christian liberty, while we have Christian liberty, true Christian brotherly and neighborly love goes the extra mile to ensure we are not causing others to stumble. And it should be our joy to abstain from things that we know may offend our brothers and sisters in the faith. Diba? I might have a freedom to do something, pero baka ma-offend si Omar. No, I will not do that. Why? Because I don't want to offend Brother Omar's walk, uh, his spiritual walk. I will gladly abstain from this. 
because I will find greater joy in knowing Omar will continue progressing. You know, as a pastor or even as a pastor intern, there are places I cannot go to, right? Uh, because people might get offended. Diba? You, you don't know. You just don't know. But we, 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 that is so important because the Apostle Paul clearly says this. Ma-offend nyo na yung unbeliever, just do not offend the, the believer. Diba? Why? Because that's true brotherly love. Diba? You will gladly sacrifice your Christian liberty for the sake of someone else's maturity. Right? Diba? Baka dumadaan lang ako, napadaan lang ako, may bar dito, may pumicture sa akin, yari. Diba? <laughs> uh, diba? So there are some places I, I really avoid. Um, Yon. And, and think about that. What are some things in your life that uh, maybe you are not considering your Christian brothers and sisters' um, maturity and, and spiritual walk? Right? Because today, ang insistence natin is, this is my right. Yeah, it's my right to do this. I'm a Christian. I'm saved by grace. I can do this. Diba? I- immature ka. Kasi hindi mo gets eh. Ikaw gusto mo, mahaba buhok mo. Ikaw gusto mo, you want to dress with a, a skirt kasi haba ng wedding gown. Ako, I don't need to, I don't feel obliged to do that. Diba? Ikaw ang immature. That's not what the Bible says. You, you go down. <laughs> you go down to the immature person. At wag niyong gagawin, immature ka kasi. So mag adjust ako para sa'yo. Ah. You, well, then that's pride, right? You, you, you offended them by, by doing that right away. Right. Um, so many people would come up to me sometimes after service and ask me questions that sometimes um, I know maybe it's not coming from a heart that's really surrendered for Scripture. I don't say, "But ka ganyan magisip? Di ka nakinig? I spoke for two hours. No. Shame on me if I if I if I do that. Lord, forgive me if I, if that happens." We, we need to love one another. You have Christian liberty to, to post on Facebook. Sure. Sure, you do. Okay. But uh, gets nyo na. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so as true and mature believers in the faith, what preoccupies our time is the proclamation of the gospel and the edifying of the saints. Because nothing brings us greater joy than to point people to Christ and to see them mature in their faith. It is no longer about our own wants and desires, but about our sacrifice for the growth and maturity of others in the faith as we aim to glorify God in all things. And I pray that that would be the kind of maturity that we have. We are so zealous to point each other to Christ that we are, kumbaga, we are all eager to sacrifice our own liberties for the sake of other people's growth. May that be CBCM. May that be CBCM. Hindi sana tayo yung ano, pa, payabangan on what we know, right? And hindi naman ganun. I'm so grateful for what God is allowing uh, in, in, in His church here. Verse 21. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Okay, simply rin lang puto. Um, so James is appeasing. What he's doing is he's appeasing the worry of the Jews. Ang, kasi ang fear nila is baka mawala yung traditions namin. We're, we might lose out all our traditions. Diba? Uh, and, and baka ma-invalidate na siya lahat which the Jews, in all sincerity, they find useful in worshiping the Lord, yung ibang traditions na yun. In this regard, James tells them, don't worry. 
hindi mawawala yung uh, some of your traditions that you truly love the Lord and obey Him through. Because bakit? Hindi mawawala yan. Because uh, the laws of Moses are being read regularly in, in synagogues. So there is a clear divine effort to preserving uh, these uh, Jewish traditions. Okay, so let's summarize. Because we, we covered a number of things today. Let me just summarize everything in a brief manner. Number one, salvation is by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Sola gracia, uh, sola fide, solus Christus. The only condition of incorporation into the kingdom of God is through the invocation of his name. I hope that's clear. Kasi dun, di ba? By, I call them by name. Number two, the history of the church as well as the life of the apostles and how they dealt with situations, katulad nitong issue na to, it's a good resource for us today as instructions for dealing with church matters and truth. Okay, so when you read the Bible, you also read how they do things. How to deal with false teachers. How to address and refute false teaching. When and how to seek consultation, etc. Number three, our success in knowing the will of God is directly influenced by the depth and seriousness we commit to his word. See Paul, see Barnabas, see Peter, and see James. They, were all, they all successfully defended their flock and, and helped them clarify truth even more uh, through this attack from the false teachers. But can you imagine if Paul, Barnabas, Peter, and James did not truly know the word? they would be unable to defend the church and its people from heresies. Unable. That's why you see so many uh, suggestions from social media from supposed pastors. They're giving all these advices that it's a super long read and it sounds really good. My question is, where did you get that from the Bible? Where did you get that the voice of the people or the voice of God in a very, very wrong context. And they, they take it to mean that whatever people say is the voice of God. Are you kidding? Sabi ko hindi tayo pupunta dyan eh. So, wag tayo pupunta dyan. Makamalihis tayo. Okay. Number four, uh, James the just, as he was known, uh, practiced strict obedience for the Lord in the law for himself, but he sincerely loved and cared for other believers as well. Alam nyo, here in the pulpit, medyo derecho tayo, right? In the pulpit, we speak of truth and it's uh, black and white. But my desire, hopefully, is that when we are dealing with you personally, it's uh, a little uh, truth pa rin, but more relational, right? More relational. Perhaps this is a reminder of who the triune God is for us, the way James is in his character, no? How? Since God is completely holy, he cannot let sin go unpunished, right? And we are all sinful, so we all have to pun be punished. Yet in his tenderness, mercy, and grace, God the Son would come into the world to take on human flesh, suffer torture and death, so that for anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in their hearts that God raised him from the dead, will no longer perish, but have everlasting life, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Tagpi-tagpi lang po yan ng iba't ibang verses. Okay, the truths of the gospel. How gracious is our Lord to save us by grace. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God. We cannot express our gratitude enough 
that you would save a wretched sinner like us so that we could be with you for eternity. Father, our desire is that you would help us live lives that are consistent with who we are in you. And we want to be used by you mightily for your kingdom, Father. And we know the only way that happens is if we truly commit to your word and truly commit to bowing down to your word. Father, may today be the day that we, we stop being neutral Christians. Help us, Father, that we be very zealous for your word. We be very zealous for your truth. We be very zealous in pursuing holiness in our lives. Please, Lord, do not allow us to find comfort in, in living a lukewarm kind of Christianity. May we be so overwhelmed by your mercy and grace that everything we do and everyone we encounter, we cannot help but point them to you and build them up to you. Help us, Father, that in our personal lives that you truly will be number one, that you truly will be priority. Father, help us to also instill disciplines in our life, disciplines that would uh, allow us time to study your word, uh, disciplines that would allow us time to submit our wills to align with your will through prayer. Help us, these, these disciplines, Lord. Father, we, we want to be like James. We want to be like Paul. We want to be like Peter. These are individuals who you used mightily for your kingdom because the, of the depth of their surrender for you. May we be known not, not by the church we go to, but by the depth of our surrender to your word. And may this church not be known for who goes here or whatever activities are in here, but may it be known because of the depth of its faithfulness and fidelity to your scripture alone. Thank you, Father God. To you always be the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May I request again po the congregation to stand. Join us in singing. your armor on, hear the call of Christ our captain, for now the weak can say that they are strong, with the strength that God has given, with shield of faith and belt of truth, to stand against the devil's lies, an army bold. Christ's love reaching out to those in darkness our call to war to love the captive soul but to reach against the captor and with the sword and raise the wounded home we will fight with faith and valor. We'll face with trials on every side. We know the outcome is secure. And Christ will have the price for which you died. An inheritance of 
of nations. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet as the Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes lies crushed beneath his feet for the conqueror has risen. And as the stone is rolled away, and Christ emerges from the grave, this victory march continues still the day. Every eye and heart shall see it. So, Spirit, come, put strength in every stride, give grace for every hurdle. To win the prize of a servant good and faithful. The saints of old still lie the way, returning triumphs of His grace. We hear the calls and hunger for the day, when with Christ we stand in glory. The saints of old still lie the way, retelling triumphs of His grace. We hear the calls and hunger for the day, when with Christ we stand in glory. May now be seated, Bob. Thank you, worship team, for that response song, and Brother Ray for leading us in the study of God's Word. We now proceed po to our worship and giving. And just for sharing before we give, for the past several weeks, me and the wife are having the privilege and joy of restudying the study series by Stephen J. Lawson, the study on the attributes of God. So as we come across this study once again, uh, napunta na po kami dun sa attribute of God's holiness. When it comes to all of the attributes of God, as many as there is, only one specific attribute was mentioned to the superlative degree. Although God is a God of love, it was never mentioned that love, love, love. Although God is a God of grace, as Brother Ray clearly preached this morning, it was not mentioned in Scripture that it was grace, 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 as it was a mention of God. But rather, the mention of his attribute to the superlative degree was the dubbing of God or the declaration that God is holy, holy, holy. Stephen Lawson derives this from Isaiah chapter 6 and allow me to share a little bit of who God is in His holiness as we proceed to our worship and giving. In Isaiah chapter 6, it reads, In the year King Isaiah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne. Now let's just stop there for a bit. During this time, it is when this king named Uzziah, uh, he perished at that year when uh, Isaiah saw this vision of God. King Isaiah was an overall good king. He's actually a king that sought after God. And not only that, uh, as he ascended his throne uh, when he was 16 years old and he ruled for 42 years, he was very much uh, leading Israel as they waged war against the Philistines and their enemies. So King Isaiah, he is a very uh, passionate king for God. He lived an overall life that's pleasing to God until pride got the best of him. During the latter time of his life, after he experienced the blessing and favor of God, he kind of grew a little bit of uh, prideful. What he did was he entered the temple. Now, during the olden times in the Old Testament, only the priest can minister in the temple. The priest tried to restrain King Hosea, but uh, he was a little bit prideful. Hindi niya 
na, hindi siya nagpapigil. Ang ginawa po niya is nagtuloy-tuloy po siya and he burned incense. And because of that, God didn't find his offering as pleasing and he was struck with leprosy until the end of his life. So to a certain extent, during this year that the king Isaiah died, this is a time that is very tragic for Israel. Their great king has fallen. Take a look at what Isaiah did here. During this time of unrest, this is what Isaiah did. He sought after God. And just a reminder to us, whenever we experience times of unrest, let us not seek ourselves, let us not find a solution according to how we see fit, but rather, let us seek God in those moments. I say he sought after the Lord, and he saw the Lord sitting high upon the throne. And it says here, the train of his robe filled the temple. You can see here the glory of God. During olden times, kings will wear uh, veils or uh, robes that had uh, a long train to show their royalty and their significance. We see here that the veil or the train of God's robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphims. It reads here, when it comes to the seraphims, they are angelic beings with six wings. And it writes here that with two wings, they cover their faces. As they behold the holiness of God, even these angelic beings that are actually sinless, they stand before God or they fly before God with wings covering their eyes because they see themselves unworthy to stand before the presence of God. Hindi sila makatingin directa sa glory and perfection and sa holiness ng Panginoon. With the other two wings, they cover their feet. Kind of a symbolism of what happened when Moses uh, approached God uh, during that uh, vision in the burning bush. God told him to take off his sandals because he is standing on holy ground. Uh, they covered this uh, humble part of the body. And with the two remaining wings, they fly. Why do they fly with the two remaining wings ready to obey the decree of this holy master? As I say, I saw this vision. He saw these seraphims worshiping God, calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. God, this is who our God is. A God who is perfect and glorious holy to the superlative degree. When it says here, holy, 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 he is a being that is holy and perfect, even holier than holy, and holiest to the ultimate degree. That is the God whom we worship. That is the God to whom we give our offerings and our uh, adoration to. And more so, just a thought, this is the God whom we sin and rebel against from time to time. A holy and perfect God. I told my students this week, whenever we sin, we don't just sin against a person. We never sin against a situation. We sin against a holy and perfect God. I say when he saw the fullness of God's holiness and the foundation of the threshold shook and the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke, he came about and wept and he said, Woe to me! For I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Sabi ni Stephen Lawson, we could say if Isaiah, but wait, Isaiah, your lips is the best thing about you because you're a prophet. You speak of the word of God. But we find here, Isaiah, seeing his unholiness in comparison to God's holiness, that my lips are unclean. We sin against this holy God. But by God's grace, he gives. In this vision, he sent one of the angels to pick up a coal from the altar of God and with the tongues that the angels was holding, he purified and purged the lips of Isaiah. In the same way in the New Testament, the beauty of it is God, he didn't just send an angel with a tongue and a coal to purify us. He purified us by the blood of his very son. This holy and perfect God giving unto man what man can never deserve, salvation and redemption. As we stand before God today giving, may we be reminded of God's holiness. He is deserving of all we can give and more. And as we give, let us also remember God's ultimate giving. 
giving what we can never deserve, giving what we can never merit on our own. That being said, let us prepare our hearts for giving. Meron po tayong offering basket or offering box sa likod. You can drop by there with the envelopes of your offering and your tights. And also, if you prefer a QR code, meron po tayong GCash QR po dyan. But allow me to pray for our giving this morning. Heavenly Father, we dedicate to you our giving. We acknowledge your holiness, your perfection. You deserve all the praise and all the adoration that we can give. Father, through our giving, may you be glorified. May you be exalted. More so as we give today, may we give with a right heart. Remembering that we are not giving because you need it, but we are giving because of joy and thanksgiving. You first gave. You first modeled giving unto us. You gave to the point that you give something so perfect that we don't even deserve it and we cannot ev uh, even merit it. Father, may we have the right heart as we give, honoring you, not giving out of obligation or compulsion, not because we want favors from you, but rather, may we give with a cheerful heart. Be glorified, Lord, through our offering and our tithes and our giving. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So good morning po ulit. Good morning, CBCM. It's a joy to worship God with you guys this morning. Now, allow me to step down again like I've been doing for the past three weeks because I cannot see with the lights. Good morning po sa atin. We would like to welcome our visitors at this point. If I'm not mistaken po, meron tayong mga bisita sa likod. Uh, Brother Ralph, can you please uh, give them the mic? Nandiyan po ba sila? Nasa labas ata sila. Okay po. So uh, from the outside, way outside po, good morning po kung nandiyan sila. Uh, welcome po to CBCM. We're glad that you can worship and join us. This morning, ayan po sila. Uh, we will be approaching you po after the service. The pastoral team will be approaching you so we can uh, know you a little bit better po. It's a joy po to join with you in worshiping God this morning. That said po, we now proceed to our announcements, mga kapatid. Slides po natin, sir. So again, welcome to CBCM, our announcements. After our worship service, after our closing prayer and benediction, and after a short break, we proceed to our koinonia time where we get to discuss the guide questions about our sermon, the sermon that we have just heard. So after po, uh, around 5 to 10 minutes to 15 minutes of coffee and restroom break, we would like to encourage everyone po na bumalik dito sa ating uh, sanctuary, sa worship center natin, and we'll gather together for our breakout session. Next po. Of course, we continue to encourage everyone to learn uh, the songs that we are singing to worship God through our uh, CBCM worship playlist uh, via Spotify. We are regularly updating then that po so we can give you uh, more of the songs that we'll be singing in the future so we can learn it together. Again, it's a joy to hear the resounding praise of God. Nandun po kami ng misis ko sa likod. It's a joy to see and hear the people of God, the congregation worshiping Him and knowing the songs. Today, 2 p.m., we continue with the basic Bible, uh, Bible doctrine class with uh, Brother Ray. That's 2 p.m. via Zoom. So the link will be reshared po sa ating group chat. Next po. We continue to have also our inductive Bible study. This is a uh, ministry that we do every Tuesday night. This is facilitated po by uh, Brother Ayan. 7.30 to around 11 p.m. po ba? Brother Ayan. Medyo mahaba po ito, but very much strengthening in our knowledge and understanding of God. So originally, this is for the worship team, but lahat po tayo is uh, free to join. Ito po is via Zoom din po, and we provide the link din po when it comes to this. Next is also, uh, brother, pabalik po muna. Uh, the midweek service, or prayer meeting po. And that being said, it is on Wednesday, 7.30 p.m., and also, we would like to encourage you, as you can see po dun sa ating bulletin, it is pre-folded already for an easy tear. There is a space there for our prayer concerns and prayer requests. Pwede po natin yan ilagay dun sa offering box or you can approach any of the pastors or any of the HFG leaders po. So uh, we can pray for those concerns come Wednesday. But nonetheless po, if you have any prayer concerns along the week, feel free to send it to our group chat. And kinokolate po yan ni uh, Ninong Chris and Ninang Sari 
they collate it and we pray for it uh, during the midweek service. 7.30 po to 8.30 po yan every Wednesday. Again, it is via Zoom. And lastly, we continue to encourage everyone to connect and be plugged in to our uh, home fellowship groups. If there's anyone here po na hindi pa po connected, you can approach any of the pastors and we can uh, plug you in to those fellowship groups. So ayun po ang ating mga announcements. That being said, may I invite everyone to please rise and let us close in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us. We thank you for everyone that's here. We thank you because the presence of the people here is a testament of your goodness and grace unto us and our families. Salamat po, Lord, for everyone who was able to join we also remember, Lord, those brothers and sisters of ours that are not here for whatever reason. I pray, Lord, that you continue to be with them as well. And may you continue to fill them as well as you have filled us as we have attended the worship service. Father, we thank you for the joy of worshiping you. We thank you for the joy more so of studying your word and gleaning from your word. And more so, we thank you for this fellowship that you have blessed us with. Father, we honor you and we praise you for our worship service and even for the remaining ministries that we have to this day or in this day. We honor you and we praise you in all these things. Church, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with us now and forevermore. Amen and amen. God bless you.